This edition of the Ridley Report is brought to you by Purse.io to beat the status quo. The Granite Flower, Part 1, The Desperate Plan Quote, The power is not delegated to the United States Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively, or to the people. Unquote. United States Constitution, Amendment 10 Chapter 1, Descent Spelled D-E-S-C-E-N-T it was customary in the sunny days of dot-com booms and grunge rock for statesmen to pontificate upon the glories of America. Their way and that of their constituents was to rejoice in the many victories which had, it seemed, brought us into a secure and prosperous age. The recent vanquishment of Soviet hegemony, the more ancient defeats of Imperial Britain and countless brutal powers in between, all had instilled in Americans a sense of casual ascendancy. Children were taught how the great victories over Nazi Germany, Germany and Soviet Russia were among the culminating efforts of the American people. These costly achievements, eclipsing all that had gone before, seemed the fit and predestined end of America's quest to rid the world of aggressive totalitarian governance. Surely this was the end of the tale. It seemed inconceivable that the same demons of tyrannical rule would rise up within the very land which had vanquished so many dictators. Yet that is what happened. That is what we lived to see. The understanding first took hold in, un in subconscious regions of the national mind. A vague apprehension asserted itself, whispered its warning to those who would listen. America's victories over foreign aggressors, coupled with well-intentioned crusades against her own social ills, were unfolding at an unbearable, unending, unnecessary cost. Like an inefficient nuclear plant doling out home energy, Washington delivered expensive triumphs. It also delivered waste and danger. Every achievement over every foe and failing generated new and cumulative hazards. These took the form of expanding federal powers. Whether needed or not at the time, many of these temporary powers waxed permanent, and America's inhabitants tended to exit each crisis with less individual liberty than they had upon entry. Here a new tax, there a new debt. Here a bold regimen for tracking citizens, there a harsh punishment for peaceable commerce. With each liberty surrendered, our land of the free became a bit more like its historical enemies, its people a bit more controlled by Washington dictate. This process was as natural as the formation of hurricanes, and had manifested itself in great powers before. But it was as subtle and cumulative as radioactive exposure, far more dangerous than the worst sea storm. Ultimately, it turned America's central government into an approximation of the very tyrannies it had bested. As in 1776 and 1941, Americans who treasured the inalienable right of property and self-defense found those rights threatened by a powerful empire. But this time, this horrific, avoidable time, that empire was their own continental government. As the third millennium neared its open, many had already begun casting about in search of an effective, uh, effective countermeasure to this rapidly growing threat. Finding none, they waited uneasily for one to emerge. But it would not be the innovations of new times which provided the concepts for our mortal salvation. The answers lay, rather, in America's near-mythic colonial past— and the fearless example of a martyred subcontinental. I'm guessing you wouldn't want to save 20% on Amazon.com, 
You wouldn't want to be able to use bitcoins instead of dollars. And you wouldn't want decentralized commerce. If I'm right in these assumptions, well, you certainly wouldn't want to visit purse.io to beat the status quo.